Now, this Sentai season is special, and I think we all know why. I decided this season to be the first season to have a 6th ranger, this season is the one that got us Power Rangers. Though it would have been interesting to see if Power Rangers started with Jetman, Daidenja, or even Bioman, as Hayam's Bond had originally used that season for his original pilot for the series. It's cool to think of what could have happened, but it's better to focus on what actually happened. Not with Mighty Morphin, that's for the future, but with its Sentai equivalent, Jurenja. Now to be perfectly honest, I only did this because I just got done watching Kamen Rider Kapito at the time of writing and wanted a new toku to watch. A commenter on my Ko Lyoko short asked for it, and I said, fuck it. Normally I don't do this, but I've been meaning to watch this for a while. Actually, I played around with the idea of doing a Zordon era marathon for the Sentai seasons, though I decided against that. It's the same reason why I don't think I'll do one for Power Rangers. I think it would be a tad bit too short, I mean, I thought about adding other shows, but eh, fuck it, it's not that big of a deal in the long run. Now, I'm just sticking to this show, obviously, for this video, and with that comment, I thought it'd be cool to see the original context for the show, doubly so for the Sphinx episode, since it was just a generic villain in Power Rangers. No riddles or stealing kids inside of trees or some shit like that. Just bam. Random Sphinx monster. Regardless, I'm hoping for the best with this series, because I did see the Barai stuff, and the Green with Evil plot was pretty good in Power Rangers, so it'll be interesting to see it here. This is my review of Kyoru Sentai Jurenja. In the modern day, well, modern for the year this was released, astronauts explore a planet near Earth known as Planet Nemesis, and while on this planet they discover a dumpster, a magical one where upon touching it breaks a seal that releases the witch Bandora. She decides, after a good couple million years, to conquer Earth. To counter this, five warriors with attitude were sealed away to be reawoken if Bandora's seal was ever broken. The wizard Barzar goes to wake them up, those being Princess of the Rishia tribe, Mei, Knight of the Daim tribe, Boy, Knight of the Eto tribe, Don, and Knight of the Sharma tribe, Goshi. I would mention the last warrior, Geki, but Barza breaks the key to his door. Well, I mean... Metal does indeed rust, but regardless, they still have to act, because two of those astronauts were kids. Because they won a con contest or something? I don't know, I forgot and don't really care. The most important thing is that they're in danger of being crushed. The Rangers have an issue rescuing the kids, because they rushed in Leroy Jenkins style. Something tells me they won't do so well in SAO. Do you know how many of you have died screaming Leroy Jenkins? While this is happening, Barzar is trying all he can to open up Geki's door, but when all seems lost, the power of the Tyranno forces a door open for the Prince of the Yamato tribe to the land of the Awaken. He goes to join this team, but in order to morph, they need their medals, which begs the question on why the medals weren't in the morphers called Dynabucklers in the first place. Regardless, they defeat the current force of Pandora's Golem Soldiers, and you would think the day is saved since Mei gets a chance to get the shrunken shuttle that the kids are in, but nope. A giant monster seals it. They are able to save them while being the first group of people to defeat a dry bones without an ice flower. With a day saved, they go to train, but the weapons keep breaking. To combat this, the rangers go to collect ancient weapons that when combined can form a powerful weapon. And they also find a way to combine their zords, the guardian beasts, by using the dino crystals. The plot really kicks up when we learn about a sixth warrior with attitude that was sealed away, Geki's older brother, Burai. Though he's not there to help, He's there to kill. Why? Well, Geki was actually taken away from his biological parents just because the king and queen of the Yamato tribe wanted a kid. Now, this was when Geki was like one year old and Burai was about eight, and thanks to this, probably other shit as well, an uprising happened, led by their biological father, and really, the royal family had it coming. The royal family was probably running the country into the ground, and taking some random family's kid was probably the last straw that caused the uprising. Burai held a deep hatred towards Geki for this, 
because of his own struggles having to live with the fairies, and when he learned that Geki was going to go into hibernation to fight Bandor in the future, he decided to do the same. Now it's obvious that he's doing this to get his revenge, but thanks to a character named Gnome, knowing full well that Barai may try and start some shit, he made it so that he can only be awoken on the same exact day he was sealed away. His grandson Ryota decides to reawaken Barai, which Gnome and Barzai decides to fucking kill him to prevent him from doing that. And the fuck thing is, Gnome is strapped to the thousandth degree, autos, semi-autos, grenades, and a fucking motorcycle. No wonder this season was the first one to be Power Rangers. This is so American that I'm shocked this wasn't kept in. Though in the end, they're old and Bandora comes into the fray knowing full well the fun that's going to be unfolded. But I reawakens, but instead of being an ally to the Rangers, I mean, I already said it, he chooses murder. Yeah, he tells the group to go to hell and kicks their ass in every single way, then runs off. Bandora goes to offer help to Burai so they can both take out the Juninja, and Burai can rule Earth. Though let's face it, both of them are going to backstab each other, though until then, Bandora is plotting something big, and that's the destruction of Daijujin, the team's Megazord. She employs Griffizar's wife, secret agent Lammy, to stalk the rangers to steal some dinosaur eggs. It's important and not important at the same time, that's why I didn't mention it. And I do have to say, Griffizar is fucking lucky to have a wife as lovely as Lammy. Barzar eventually realized that Bandora is waiting for an eclipse to take out Daijijin, since the sun emits something called Gaiatron energy. It's pretty much an energy source for Daijijin and the zords that make him up. And with the eggs and a random bus of kids as a hostage, the rangers are forced to form the Megazord. The eclipse happens, and not just Griffithar and Lamy grow, but Burai does as well to lay the smackdown on Daijijin, pretty much destroying him. The rangers are at a loss, unable to defeat any monsters that grow giant size. Up on the moon, Bandora celebrates the loss of Daijijin, but Burai does the double cross first, only to get tossed out and lands on Earth. When he lands, he meets a random kid that leads him to a room where time never stops. There's a catch, because nothing in life is free. But I has a time limit of 38 hours on Earth. The candle represents his remaining time, and the kid gives him the Jusokin, or as we Americans know it as, the Dragon Dagger. This is Burai's ticket to and from the outside world in this room. Since he doubts his time limit, he goes out to choose murder once again, playing the Jusokin and accidentally summoning Dragon Caesar. Now, up until this point, Geki had concerns about fighting his brother, but seeing the destruction he's been causing, it's Geki's turn to choose murder, so he goes to kick Burai's ass, which, yeah, he does, and seeing that he's defeated, and while well, Geki isn't a murderer, he leaves. But that doesn't mean Burai ain't gonna try to kill Geki himself, where Geki just straight up says, dude, if you're gonna chill out after killing me, then just get it over with. Though Burai can't bring himself to do that, and realizes that murder really isn't the best way to get rid of hatred, and officially joins the team. The Zords also reappear. They were actually healed by the Gaiatron entry inside the Earth, and thanks to the new member on the team, they lock a new Megazord in Gorujin. The downside is that Burai doesn't have that much time left for the world. He and Geki eventually gain a new weapon for the team while also learning of King Brachion. Thanks to Bandora summoning the Prince of the Sulfury Void, you get a cookie for knowing that reference, they have to recruit Brachion to stop the Devil and Bandora. They do this by forming this season's Ultra Zord, Ultimate Daijijin. The Devil is sealed back in Hell, well, for now. Pandora's goal at the moment is decreasing Burai's time, which she eventually does by getting his time down to around 9 hours left. Burai is on death's door. During the quest for King Burakion, it's revealed why Burai has this time limit. And it's kind of fucking stupid in my opinion, because it just feels like a hand wave. Um, unlike the others, which if you haven't been watching, just listening, but I wasn't sealed in the same fashion as them. They were sealed in the Phantom Zone, for lack of a better term, while Burai got the Egyptian King treatment. In the cave that he was sealed in, a cave -in happened that killed him. So Daijin asked Clotho to bring him back, and it's kind of sudden. The same with how the others learn about this, because all of this is revealed in Burai's room. And I really don't like this, but regardless, as we all should know by now, but I does indeed die. Bandora tricks him out of the timeless room by having Adora Monster disguise itself as Dragon Caesar. Thanks to that, Bandora is able to pinpoint the exact location of the room, and once located, she goes there and destroys it, leaving him about under an hour or so before he kicks it. Though he plans to brighten up one kid's day with what time he has left. You see, in his dreams, he saw a kid waiting to be taken to the afterlife, so he decides to make whatever time the kid has left a blast, not knowing that it will cause the kid's end. The others are researching how to keep Rai alive and discover an elixir. The group goes on a quest to get it, but only Goshi and Dan are actually able to go on that quest. Though in the end, 
it's revealed that it wouldn't have worked regardless. But I already cheated death once thanks to Daijijin, and the elixir will have no effect. But I goes out a hero being able to take out the monster of the day and telling the others to give the elixir to the kid to save his life. The Burai does pass a Jusoken and the Dragon Shield to Geki. This is a nice upgrade that they're gonna need since Satan is on his way back. In preparation for this, he revives Bandora's son, Kai. The little shit kidnaps some kids to pilot a new Dora monster to draw out King Brachion. Once that's accomplished, instead of returning after defeating the monster of the day, King Brachion stays and gets swallowed by Quicksand. Dying, apparently, and that's not a good thing since in the meantime they found the dino eggs and Brachion decided to keep them with him. If those eggs are gone, then, well... <laughs> They can't morph anymore. The rest of the Zords also get swallowed up, and after surviving attacks from Gunfrazar and Lamy, the Rangers learn the truth on what happened to the Zords. Thanks to the Ghost of Burai, he informs them that they're in a pocket dimension, and they need to traverse it to rescue the Zords. They then rescue the Zords, kill off Satan once and for all, as well as Bandora's kid. Thanks to her crying over the poor little shit, she loses her powers, and Daijijin seals her in another fucking dumpster. I really don't understand why that wasn't an option in the first place, but regardless, the rangers go to the afterlife while letting random kids take care of the baby dinos. Sounds like a horrible idea, but I've seen another show that did a equally dumb idea. Uh, then again, that show was good. Let's get this out of the way, the narrative is fucking boring as all hell. Uh, the biggest contributor to this is the spreading of these story important episodes. Like, you need to spread this out and not give us this by the Steven Universe method. Now, this wouldn't be an issue if the filler was good, but no. This is the most boring filler I've ever seen in my life. The only filler episodes I actually liked was, well, one of them was episode 35, Ninja Warrior Boy, where Boy stumbles across a ninja house and eventually helps his ninja family protect a special elixir that's supposed to give eternal life. The other rangers join in the fun and stops the villains from stealing it. It was a fun episode, but that's really it. The other episode was where uh, Don and May became punks and just got a human kill count. Like, like no shit, there's a fucking drug smuggling thing and they just come in with Tommy guns and just gun these guys down it's like it's like a fucking mob movie and it's funny to think about that there's two possibly three rangers since you know Burai is here with a full out human kill count everything else i found to be like so boring even the villains which let's get on them real quick more specifically the main chick herself the witch bandora i cannot believe i found a worse villain than her ranger counterpart but giving her a reason for why she's doing this way at the end is is something that did not need to be a thing if they wanted it, it should have been a thing sometime earlier in the season. So in short, her son Kai was a little shit that was stabbing some dino eggs. The mother of those eggs saw it and rightfully chased him and was most likely going to eat him, and Kai just fell off a cliff to his death. Because of that, Bandora, who was actually a queen during the dino period, sold her soul to the devil because of her idiotic son. Now without this, she was a decent, with gigantic quotes, evil for being evil villain. Hell, she's even a good boss to work with. In the episode that Lammy is introduced, she reunited Lammy and Gryphazar since they're married and gave Gryphazar the ability to speak. Now I wonder how he even got Lammy in the first place if he couldn't talk, the lucky bastard. Then she promises the rest of her crew rewards as well, and that's a neat bit to her character. The reason her motivation bugs me is partly because of how late this came into play. I get the feeling that they wanted us to care about Bandora wanting her son to be her son again, or rewarding, I know. Being unable to, triply so at the end, since Kai came down with a horrible case of the dying, just turns him into Jabby. With more episodes, yes, but a Jabby nonetheless, and ruins any emotional impact this has. I don't even know why she hates kids so much as well. She clearly cares for her son, so much so that she's shocked to see him alive and wants to be a family again with him, even crying over him when he kicks a bucket. Hell, Gryphazar and Lammy actually had a kid at one point, which begs the question who the heck was taking care of it, and Bandora at first hated the baby, but grew to like the idea of having it around like five seconds. I mean, she had to get used to the kid at one point, but yeah, this just makes her confusing for me. They may have been something in that DVD special movie, don't know, don't really care that explain her hatred for kids, but this just makes me think Rita's better, doubly so when she gets hitched to Zed. Since they destroyed the ninja powers together, the Thunder Megazords, and the fucking command center, but yeah, Bandora's just evil, nothing more to add to change this factor. The other villains aren't really good, uh, Bookback and Toadpad just reminds me on why the ranger counterparts just disappeared after a while in Power Rangers, like, I don't even think they really appear that much, like, 
past the halfway point in season two. Apparently their last episode was a Zeo beginning, but I'm not sure and I'm not on MMPR or Zeo yet. And they were just bumbling idiots and that's all I care to write about them. Lazy I know, but the only thing I can remember is that one episode where Toadpad was trying to drink some kid's blood. Griffizar and Lammy was all right. Kind of want to know their background some more, especially with them being married. Again, I don't really get how he was able to charm Lammy by not being able to talk, but again, they're fine. For the good guys, Barthar is just there for exposition. Seriously, the only thing he really did outside of that is just help boy May with that rope and pray to the gods to return Daijijin. Which in the end was pointless because the Zords were healed by that Gaiatron energy and just returned after a little bit. I do not like Bride's time limit. Look, I'm not opposed to him just straight up dying, which is unfortunately ironic, but he just he's just non-existent in the show unless it's purely plot related or he's just bailing Geki out. But that's only by summoning Dragon Caesar, because he really doesn't stick around after the monster is destroyed. For understandable reasons, don't get me wrong, but it just bugs me. I mean, I like the guy. After getting that stick out of his ass about what happened in the past, for me, he's just not on screen that much for my liking. Once he lets his anger go, that would have been perfect for some brotherly bonding, but no, he could be counted as another f***ing Zord. The dude barely popped up, and that's disappointing because I really did like the Evil Six Ranger arc. I also love that he tried to give that kid the best day of his life because of the whole death thing. Really, the only good thing about the show because the rest of the characters are just there. Yeah, I have to be perfectly honest, I don't like our main cast, they're just boring. They stay one note all throughout. Uh, maybe except for Geki, and that's because of Burai. His want to bond with him and learning that he can is sad, but outside of that, I don't care. Maybe I'm being unfair since I'm just glossing over these guys, but this show was a fucking slog to get through. I did not want to keep watching, doubly so after the Burai arc. A funny thing is, this was one of the first Sentais I watched after discovering Super Sentai and realizing that this is where Power Rangers came from. Should have saw something was up when things went from digital to film then back to digital, but I wanted to see this as a kid and just dropped it after they got their weapons. It's boring as all hell to me, and this in Galanja is a good lesson on why the Sentai isn't always better. Oh wait a second, I almost forgot about the damn dinosaur eggs for a pretty good reason in my opinion. These things are brought up and dropped more times in my attention span. When the age of dinos came to an end, with Bandora grieving over her idiot, a random tribe sent a pair of dinosaur eggs into the water to preserve the species. A random tribe that directly served the gods, tending to their garden, fucked up and ate some of the fruit and were banished, also given monkey tails for some reason, and their goal was to track down these eggs and then they can go back to their original position. I hate the setup to this because these guys are never seen again. For a one-off, yeah, it's understandable that they won't be there anymore, but I'm bugged when it's story important. I don't even get why the rangers weren't told about the eggs beforehand, since the Juninja powers are apparently somewhat tied to the things. If the things were flat out killed, then that's it, Bandora won, so that's Daijijin fucking up. And even then, if the rangers learned about this beforehand, they probably would have started tracking them down immediately. They lived in that land, and they most likely loved dinos, so why not tell them about it? It's strange, the dinosaur egg plotline really bugs me because of that. Not to mention the fact that they just leave them there with kids who have no idea on how to take care of them. Like, let's forget what scientists know about T-Rexes nowadays, because back then they thought these things were fucking predators and not scavengers. Barely read up on the things. Again, only kid in the world not to care about them. But I doubt the kids can give them dog food and that's it. These things would be malnourished in a heartbeat unless one of these kids have butchers for parents. But then that will only get them so far, triply so when they become giant size. I don't know why the rangers aren't the ones taking care of these things. It would make much more sense if they stayed on Earth to raise them. Ah, oh, fuck my life. I don't even know why I decided to add the dino stuff to my script. These things didn't mean that much in the grand scheme of things for the story. It felt like they fucking forgot to add these things and were scrambling to put them in at points, when I don't even think they mattered in the first place. Even then, the narrative is just... It's just boring. You know, as much as I bitched in this video, the acting's actually really good. I love the casting for the characters. 
Hell, I may not like the character, but Bandora's actress, the late and great Soga Machiko-san, is perfect in the role. Her charisma is fantastic, especially when dealing with her staff. I just love her acting, and she's been in other Sentai seasons. Uh, the rest of the cast is, well, great as well. No real complaints other than Mei's actress, Chiba Reiko-san. She sounds a tad bit too high-pitched for me. I hate for that to be her actual voice. I mean, it, it kind of seems like it is, because she did reprise her role in uh, Kyorija vs. Go-Busters. If that's not her natural voice, I think it may be too high pitch for live action, but if it is, uh, Chiba-san, I am indeed sorry. Music-wise, I don't really like it. Like, this shit ain't bad, but it's not epic. Hell, it's probably why I didn't find the fight scenes that good, because any bout of music played just made the whole entire thing feel dull. I may be spoiled thanks to Ron Rasterman's music. Like, seriously, a lot of music he composed is just awesome, but the background is just dull. The intro and ending is alright as well, nothing great or anything like that, though I will say that the main chorus of the intro is actually really good. Though that's really it, nothing more to really add to it. Action-wise, the fights can be pretty fun when the music isn't syncing it for me. Though I really do love the Megazord fights, even if they're not anything to write home about. Though I only say that because I've been watching the current season, Avatar Sentai Dawn Brothers, where they've been using CGI way too much. Seriously, modern day Sentai production needs to stop with the CGI because it somehow peaked in Gadaja. It's just nice to go back to costumes for Megazord fights, and these are pretty good. My favorite is when Burai was still on the evil side, growing 10 stories high to lay the smackdown on Daijijin. Triply so, since in Sentai or Power Rangers, growing for the Rangers isn't really seen a lot. I mean, there's a finale to Power Rangers Zeo, but that's really it. Regardless, the Megazords are pretty f***ing bulky, but hey, they do indeed look cool. I mean, Daijijin and Gyorijin were the first Megazords to appear here in the West, and let's face it, it's iconic to us for a good reason. They're great. Hell, even the Ultra Zord is awesome. Although it's a tad bit too bulky for my liking, but hey, as long as it's not good cool Kaiser VSX. Really, the only combination I don't like is Jute Daijijin, and it's ironic because it's just Ultimate Daijijin without King Brachion. I think my issue with it is that it just doesn't mesh well without the Ultra Zord combo. In terms of Ranger costumes, they're awesome, and they've always been on my top 10 Ranger costumes. Hell, I even love the Morphers called the Dino Bucklers. Not just because of the whole first Power Ranger season, but just because of how unique they are. Morphers tend to be wrist straps or a cell phone like 90% of the time, and I love when they go low unique for this stuff. Well, as long as it's not a fucking scanner that takes like a thousand years to morph the rangers. So now, taking into account of story, characters, acting, and sound, uh, Jurenja gets a 1. This was fucking boring, like, no shit, this in Yakuji Sentai Gadanja has proven to me that the Sentai is not always better than Power Rangers. This was a slog to get through, and aside from the fights, I just didn't enjoy myself. I think I already said this, but I think there's a reason why I never got past the first couple of episodes as a kid. It just bores me. It bored me then and it bores me now. Hell, I don't even like how fucking simple defeating Bandora was. Like again, they didn't kill her. Daijin just resealed her into a fucking dumpster and threw her. Why could they could they just do that beforehand whenever she popped up on Earth? Yeah, I know the rest of the group may have done something to stop that, but it's just with how easy it, it felt like they defeated her, that's my issue. Also, I really hate how the story episodes weren't spread out that well, but regardless, I don't recommend the show, like, at all. Out of the Sentai, at least early Heisei, even if Sentai isn't hard-coded into Japan's era, it just doesn't work for me. Well, outside of the Burai stuff, but that's the exception, not the rule. But hey, if you want to watch it legally, well, outside of the awesome Shout Factory DVDs, it's available for legal streaming over on Tubi TV. I really like this streaming service, so I will always say get a physical copy or sail the high seas. Uh, the only issue with using the service is that your watching queue is a little hard to find on PC. Regardless, for alternate recommendations, while well, this is a fantasy show, but I'm not really into fantasy, except for The Legend of Zelda Twilight Princess. And I'm also gonna throw in Kamen Rider Kuga, since I just started watching that for that marathon. And Twilight Princess, we follow one of the many incarnations of the Hero of Time, Link. This time, he's a farmhand working in Ordon Village, where he gets a chance to go to Hyrule Castle to deliver a shield. But due to Ganon, because it's almost always Ganon, that doesn't happen, and now he's stuck as a wolf for the time being, helping out a girl named Minna. In Kamen Rider Kuga, we follow Goldai Yusuke, a guy who thinks he was archaeologist friend, puts on an ancient belt that fuses together with him. After a couple of punches, he morphs into a being called Kuga. He eventually gets roped into working with the police to take out these unidentified creatures. When next we meet my friends, it'll unfortunately be with the sequel to a great Transformers series. <sighs> that being Beast Machines Transformers. 
So my friends, please like, comment, and subscribe, and have a good night, day, morning, afternoon, or whatever time it is for you. Godzilla, but due to international copyright laws, it's not. Still, we should run like it is, Godzilla! Though it isn't.